Okay, welcome back everybody and welcome to our afternoon session. We are very happy that a lot of people stayed and other people showed up. And I want to introduce our next speaker. It's Kelly Robbins here from Cornell Cults, College of Agriculture and Life Science. Uh, I also have uh, written down School of Integrative Plant Science, Plant Breeding and Genetic Section. Um, Previous, his previous work was um, as a director of Gen Gen Genomic Open Source Breeding Information Initiative, GOP2, uh, at Cornell from 2015 to 17. Um, his academic background, uh, the bachelor uh, from the University of Tennessee, Master of Science from the University of Georgia, and also he made his PhD at the University of Georgia. Then um, I found a link in that he was adjunct assistant professor of agronomy at Purdue University from 2010 to 2015. Um, then quantitative geneticist, uh, probably um, uh, everything of that at Doe AgroScience, right? Yes. Uh, quantitative geneticist, quantitative genetic group leader. And that was between 2008 and 2015. After that, everything I taught, uh, talked about before. And it's a great pleasure to have you here. and. Um, Welcome. Ah, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> thank you for the invitation. It's, it's great to be able to get out of Bradfield, especially on a day like today, and <laughs> listen to some good science. Uh, so uh, my talk today, it's, it's a little bit of a kind of a generic title, but in some ways I think captures a lot of what I do pretty well. Uh, so we're, you know, I, I guess the theme here is, is uh, you know, omics and, and how we can integrate omics for discovery. You know, I'm very specifically working in the area of how we can use omics types of data to change the way in which we do plant breeding. You know, so uh, we've talked a lot about, you know, our ability now to generate large amounts of information. We can do this relatively cheaply. And so there's a, you know, a real question of, you know, how can we use this types of technology to improve genetic gains in a lot of the crops? And in particular, I do a lot of work with breeding programs in Africa and South Asia. So really trying to address how can we bring this to breeding programs and use it to drive uh, genetic gain. Um, and to do this, I, I think sometimes it's helpful to kind of take a step back and really think about how we do breeding and, you know, how to effectively integrate these technologies into breeding. And I'm going to talk about... Uh, two areas that I've been working here, one is genomics and one is phenomics. Uh, in the area of genomics, I'm going to be talking a little bit about genomic selection, which I consider to be a, a fairly mature area in terms of our understanding. I, I know some influential people in animal breeding would say that this is a solved problem, but in plant breeding it definitely isn't. Uh, what we find is that you know, in theory it's a solved problem, but if you look at what is actually done in breeding programs versus what is theoretically the best approach is, uh, there's a, a very big difference. And so we're working at trying to bridge that gap a little bit better. Then in the area of phenomics, I, I consider this to be uh, much more of, a, of an exploratory area, especially in the field of, of plant breeding, which is sort of understanding how we can effectively utilize proximal sensing to, to understand how plants uh, are developing over the growing season, how they're interacting with the environment, and how that is influencing a lot of these traits that are very important to, to plant breeding programs. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit. So in the area of genomic selection, I actually want to use a term called predictive breeding, because genomic selection, if you're talking to a plant breeder, can uh, elicit different uh, types of responses and feelings. But I think that, that at a high level, we can all agree that in plant breeding, you know, one of our main goals is to be able to accurately infer the genetic merit of a new line as early cost effectively and as accurately as possible. And so to, to set this up, and, and maybe this isn't that necessary for this audience, I just like to sort of set the stage of you know, really what a, a kind of traditional or how a traditional breeding program operates, right? So we're going to have some phase where we, we cross some new lines to generate recombinants. There's going to be uh, some work that goes into fixing those recombinants into some stable form. And then we're going to plant them out in what we call, uh, this is maybe more of an industry term, but a variety development pipeline. And, and this is really just a series of experiments where we try and screen out what the best of these recombinants are. Typically, we start out by screening lots of new lines or varieties. Uh, we have very little information on them, and as we go down, uh, we're whittling it down to fewer and fewer varieties, but we're also testing these at more and more locations to gather more information, right? And so the end consequence of this is that 
This process is actually really accurate. So extensive testing provides very accurate estimates of performance of these lines. And so breeders can make decisions with a lot of confidence that they're really making the correct decisions. The downside is, is that it's slow. So extensive testing over multiple years leads to long generation intervals. And if we think about, you know, increasing genetic gain, it's a function of generation interval. Um, you know, in the denominator of that equation. So anything that we can do to cut down on the time it takes to make decisions can have very significant impacts on a response to genetic gain. And so that's where, you know, the, the, the sort of concept of, of genomic selection comes in, right? And so the idea is that if we, if we understand the relationship between the genotypes or the genomic information and the phenotypes, that we don't necessarily have to screen these lines in a lot of different environments to understand their phenotypes, that we can simply use uh, you know, models that are trained on historical data to be able to predict what we believe is going to be the performance of these lines and make decisions. And so that you know, enables us to theoretically drive down generation interval to the biological limits so we can make decisions as fast as we possibly can go. You know, the downside is, is that you know, we deal with complex traits, so this isn't really a, you know, a perfect understanding. So uh, we tend to have reduced accuracy. And so what that means is we have to make decisions with much less accurate information. And uh, in animal breeding, that, that was sort of the paradigm that they always operated in. In plant breeding, it, it represents a bit of a shift in, in, in a paradigm that uh, is sometimes hard to convince people of. Um, the advantage here is that it's fast. So we significantly re reduce the generation intervals. But there's also many different ways to implement a predictive breeding program and bring genomic selection in. And so I think a lot of people, when, when you think about genomic selection, sort of jump right to this recurrent genomic selection cycle where we're just recombining lines based purely off of predictive information. But there's also a lot of different ways that we can implement this into a breeding program. In many ways, this is theoretically the best way to do it, but it's also the most difficult to implement effectively and, and, and make it work in practice. So we have an approach of trying to sort of break down the implementation of genomic selection into a, a few different phases to try and bring programs, in, you know, along in sort of a stepwise fashion. So we kind of define phase one as, you know, implementing a lot of the foundational capabilities, right? So uh, the information and the modeling that goes into making decisions uh, in a predictive breeding type of program are much more complex. and so. Uh, you really have to have good uh, informatics in place. Uh, you need to really have good standard operating procedures for how you do sampling and genotyping, et cetera, to be able to implement this effectively. But the starting point, no matter where you want to end up, is you have to figure out a way to genotype all of your entries that are going into your performance trials, because that is what's going to build up your predictive training set for, for your models. And so at some point, you have to be able to start genotyping everything. Phase two, you know, I really define as starting to optimize this actual VDP pipeline to make it more efficient, so be able to bring genomic information to try and reduce the number of years of testing before we release a variety, but also to increase our selection intensity and in how we implement this pipeline. And then phase three defined as uh, really moving towards, you know, rapid uh, cycling genomic selection. All right, and so to start at the beginning, which is really where we're at with almost all of the breeding programs that we're working with in the public sector right now, to, to achieve this large-scale implementation, we have to figure out how to start genotyping everything that they put into trials, but do it in a cost-effective manner, right? So the first barrier to actually getting someone to implement in your genomic selection is, is getting them to think about how can you afford to start genotyping everything, right? The most obvious way to do it is to reduce the phenotyping which isn't necessarily very popular, right? So if we reduce the number of plots that we have for each line in early stage testing, this reduces the accuracy um, of, of the estimates of performance in the trial, right? So the breeders have less accurate information now to make decisions on. If we do reduce the number of lines being tested in the early uh, stage trials, it reduces the selection intensity, right? And so there's this inherent conflict initially trying to implement genomic selection, which is you're asking a breeder to sacrifice short term for a potential long term gain and you know anyone that looks at you know let's say statistics on how people save for retirement knows that that goes against human nature in a lot of ways so ideally we would have some way to be able to do this without sacrificing the short term performance gains right and so there are there are some new advantages uh, uh, in terms of developments in genotyping platforms right so now 
We do have platforms to be able to genotype thousands of markers for less than $10 per line. So now we're getting at, down into a space where the cost to genotype a line for genomic prediction is approximately the same as what it costs to run a plot in some of these regions. But we also just have to be smarter about what we genotype and how we set up our experimental designs. Right, and so I want to talk about two approaches that we're working with some breeding programs on to implement here. So one is this idea of full SIP prediction. Um, so the accuracy of genomic prediction, I'll touch on this in, in a later slide, um, depends a lot on how related your training set is to your prediction set. And so it's hard to get much more related than being full SIPs. And so this approach tries to leverage this, this fact that you can get fairly accurate predictions by training on a full SIP. And so what you do is you, uh, you reduce the number of plots by only testing half of a family that you generate, right? So you put one half of the family in the field. Uh, a lot of the programs we work with are an optimal or also test an optimal and drought conditions very early on. So you put half in the field, the other half you just genotype and you set it aside. You then train a model on the half that are in the field, you use it to predict the other half, and so you advance half of the family based off phenotypic performance and you base the other, advance the other half based off of uh, genotype performance. And then so when you go into year two testing, it's some mix of things that you've tested in the field and things that you predicted. And so this is one way to potentially get around how to reduce the number of plots that you're running in the field to offset the cost of genotyping. And so this is actually what the CIMIT uh, East African maize program did. Uh, they did this with uh, multiple families. Uh, basically 50% were tested, uh, the other 50% were predicted. They advanced roughly half of their lines based off genomic predictions and they advanced the other half through phenotypic testing. And then in 2018 they ran them all in trials. And what they found, uh, which was quite promising, was the lines that they advanced based off of genomic predictions alone basically had uh, identical performance in these yield trials as the lines that they advanced based off of phenotypic performance. And so this was a nice promising result that showed that we could potentially reduce the number of plots that we put in the field without having a substantial decrease in the performance of the VDP in the short term as an incentive to start getting these programs to, to routinely genotype their lines. An alternate approach to doing a full SIB type of uh, uh, implementation is to do something called sparse testing. So in sparse testing, what you do is in the first stage trial, maybe I, I plant these lines at four locations. You know, so one way to do this would be to only plant half of those lines in the four locations. The other way to do this would be to plant one half of the population in two of the locations and the other half of the population in the other two locations. And so in this type of sparse testing design, you're using the same number of plots, but everything goes into the field. So you have everything in the field um, at, at least one of the locations that you're testing, right? So there, you know, a key advantage of this approach is that you have phenotypic information collected on everything that you're genotyping. This helps build your ultimate prediction model. Um, disadvantage is you have to produce seed for more lines, so it's a little bit more expensive. Um, and as I said before, you know, phenotypes uh, are often being collected um, in multiple different environments, uh, optimal and drought conditions. And so one way to think about, you know, a phenotype under optimal conditions and a phenotype under drought conditions is that, in essence, these are two correlated traits. And so we can implement essentially a, a I, I wouldn't say a complex, but we can use mixed models to model those correlations between these locations. And the idea is that by doing that, we can get even more accurate predictions. And so the question is, what really is a more effective way of doing this, a half sib prediction approach or a sparse testing approach? And so we tested this with 13 maize families. Um, we've also done some work in chickpea with the ICRSAT breeding program. And what we find is that um, of all the traits, all the locations, all the trials that we've ever looked at, um, sparse testing is always superior in terms of the accuracy, accuracy of prediction versus a half sib uh, approach. And so, at least from the standpoint of deriving the most accurate possible uh, predictions and, and in terms of an effective way to reduce the number of plots without decreasing accuracy, it seems that sparse testing is is a clear winner. Um, again, the only challenge with sparse testing is it's somewhat more complex to implement in terms of making your advancement decisions, and so that's something that has to be considered. So getting more into uh, optimization of the VDP, and so whether we're doing a sparse testing approach or a half sib prediction approach, it still requires us uh, to see everything in the sparse testing, we have to put everything in the field and look, look at it in the field for one year before we make our initial advancements. 
half sib, we're putting half of the family in the field to predict the other half. But both of these, both of these approaches prevent us from actually cutting a year out of the VDP process. So ideally what we could do is we could take historical information on other lines that are related to this, use that to predict performance and actually bypass the first stage of testing. And that's where we're going to get our real gains in terms of the performance of our VDP. Um, the problem here is, is that um, the expected accuracy of genomic predictions is really a function, it's a function of the heritability of the trait, but it's also a function of how closely related lines are to each other, right? And, and you could think of this really as how well are the markers that you're genotyping actually tracking the causative QTL that are driving uh, the, the trait itself. And so in this case, ME is really a function of the, the, really the genomic relationship between the lines and the training uh, and the prediction data sets. And so your, your, your expected accuracy is, is both a function of the size of your training set, but it's also a function of how related your training set is. Here, uh, you know, the traditional equation would have the heritability here. What we find is that when you go back into historical information for a lot of reasons, some information is more accurate than other information, and so uh, we like to actually replace this with the average reliability of the estimates that we're putting into this. And so again, we have our maze, uh, a training set here, which has 13 populations. It's a highly structured data set because this is really a set of a lot of half sib lines, and so there's a lot of interrelatedness between these. So the question here is, is we know that using full sibs to predict the future performance works quite well. We've demonstrated that in the field. Can we go back and mine historical information and try and achieve similar prediction accuracies? And so looking at, you know, across a lot of these populations, and these are the same populations that went into that actual field validation. So there's a, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I, I would just focus in on a couple of things. So this red bar here represents the accuracy that we get when we use full sibs. To, to train our, our, our prediction models. The purple bar here is excluding all full SIBs but including everything else we can possibly put into that predictive model. And then everything in between here represents some optimal training set, which is we're trying to balance the amount of information that we're putting in, but we're also trying to minimize the genetic distance between the training set and the prediction set. So we're trying to find that, that optimal sweet spot. What's interesting is, is you know, unsurprisingly, um, you know, that, that using full SIBs uh, tends to give us a, a lot of advantage in predictions, especially if we're dealing with a, a full SIB family that has a lot of lines in it. So in other words, we have a lot of full SIBs that we can use in our training, but not always. And the other interesting thing is, is even though these are all mostly half SIB lines, they're, they all share one parent in, in common, Using all of the information is almost never the best approach in terms of training an accurate prediction model. And what's interesting is that in many cases, the, the most accurate models use a relatively small subset of the tonal phenotype. So we're here we're just talking about having you know, 200, 300 records in our training set can get us really high prediction accuracies. And this is promising for a couple of reasons. One is, if we're smart about how we design our training sets for our predictions, it certainly suggests that even in a program that's in its very initial stages of trying to generate this information, it is possible to use historical information to get accurate predictions and optimize their implementations. So I'm just going to wrap that up now, uh, other than say moving forward, uh, you know, we still have more work that we need to do on, on these algorithms for identifying optimal training sets. Given, a, given the size of the training set, we're pretty good at identifying what the optimal subset is and then seeing how well it actually worked, but sort of a priori identifying what the optimal number of lines to include in the set uh, still seems to be a little bit challenging. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around the, the VDP optimization, so looking at some kind of combination of optimal training sets to predict from historical data combined with sparse testing. Um, and we're in the process of doing, you know, some simulations on really how to, uh, you know, appropriately implement a, a rapid cycle re recurrent selection uh, approach with some of these breeding programs. And so right now we're focusing predominantly on the Cement East African Maize program um, and the Chickpea program. Um, for ICRSAP, this is going to be expanding into a lot of more uh, crop breeding programs in the next couple of years. All right, so the second topic I wanted to touch on was this area of remote sensing. And I'll try and get, get through this a little bit quick. Um, so the objectives of this study was really to try and understand the genetic architecture of these traits in maize. And, and so I come from a statistical background, so when I say understand genetic architecture, 
I'm talking about understanding the parameters of the statistical distributions that describe the actual variation that we see in these traits. Examine the relationship between development curves as measured by these indices and indices and traits and explore the use of random regression models. Um, so the data that we're working with here is data that came from the Genomes and Fields Initiative. So we have data from 2015, two locations, and 2017. Um, if you look at how uh, these images sort of distri uh, are distributed across growth stages, you can see that it's predominantly early uh, reproductive through late reproductive. Uh, we don't have a lot of information on the vegetative growth stages here. Indices we're looking at are uh, a few different indices that really look at kind of plant health. Um, uh, NDVI, uh, which is a function of NIR and, and the red band. Uh, NDRE, which is a function of NIR and red edge. And then SAVI, which adds a, a background soil uh, a correction into it. Uh, the big difference between NDVI and N NDRE is that NDVI um, at sort of the peak of, of the plant's, you know, uh, canopy and photosynthesis, uh, it, it's an indice that can get a little bit saturated, so you, you lose some of the variability. Uh, NDRE, which is on the, the lower corner here, can give us some better discrimination um, uh, in some of these uh, uh, growth phases. Um, when we look at heritability estimates, uh, one of the nice things was that you know, when you extract phenotypes from these images, they're actually quite heritable. And if we compare this to yield, yield might have a, yield in these same trials had a heritability somewhere between 0.3 and 0.45. So you can see that it varies quite a bit from season to season and growth stage to growth stage. But in general, we get reasonable heritabilities for all of these indices, which, uh, you know, suggest that there is genetic variation here that we can select upon. Um, we wanted to look at, uh, how this type of information could contribute to our ability to predict performance. And this is you know, so basically what we're looking at here is uh, across each of these locations, this black line represents how well we can predict yield a, on a plot basis using purely genomic information. So in other words, we train a model and we use genomic information to predict it. If we add uh, information from these indices to the genomic information, this represents the increase in predictive ability we have. For grain yield, you can see that uh, across a lot of these re reproductive stages and across the various indices, we're getting a nice bump in our prediction accuracy. Um, and we can also look at here, these are estimations of the genetic correlation between these indices and the end of, uh, end of season trait for grain yield. We can see that we're getting pretty high correlations at a lot of these time points. Grain moisture with this particular experiment was a little bit different. Um, we saw very different patterns in uh, the correlations between these indices and moisture in the, in the two different years, um, and that translated into some, some different patterns in terms of our ability to explain grain moisture as an indice of trade based off of these indices. Uh, so the last thing is uh, we did a little bit of work uh, on implementing random regression models, and I, I guess just to give a little bit of background of what a random regression model is. And so if we think about a longitudinal trait, right? Um, if we have six different time points, uh, a somewhat naive way to model this would be to say, let's treat each time point as a different trait, each one having a different genetic correlation, right? And so, in general, what you'd expect is time points that are close together to have a higher genetic correlation and time points that are further apart from each other to have a lower genetic correlation. Uh, we could potentially estimate a separate genetic correlation for every single pairwise combination, or we could assume that there's some kind of pattern here and, and implement uh, some restrictions that would reduce the number of parameters. A random regression model considers phenotypes at multiple time points as one trait that changes over time rather than multiple discrete traits that are related to each other. And so with the random regression model, what you try and do is you try and develop a function that models the change in variance and covariance over time. And by developing this function, you can potentially uh, accommodate time points on a continuous scale, and you can also greatly reduce the complexity of the model that you're trying to estimate. And of course, you can always reconstruct uh, based off of whatever function of time you're using as a part of this to reconstruct the six by six matrix in this case. Um, in terms of implementation, uh, we used uh, the data from 2017 where we had five time points. The random regressions uh, incorporated a genomic relationship uh, for the genetic effect, we use a linear spline, we model heterogeneous residual variances, and the first time point and the last 
time points were used as knots. And so, in terms of implementing a random regression, there's you know two approaches you can do. One is a what's called a Legendre polynomial, and this allows you to fit a, a very standardized polynomial function where there's restrictions on uh, the, the values uh, to ensure that, that you can transform uh, from the function to the various uh, variance covariance parameters over time. Uh, a spline function is a little bit more simple. In this case, a linear spline, in essence, what you're assuming is a, a simplified series of linear functions that you're going to use to approximate a higher order, um, uh, a higher order uh, a function. So with uh, 2017 data, we had five time points. And so if we treated each of these as, as, separate, um, as separate time points and we estimated the full variance covariance matrix, this is what we would end up with. Here, the darker blue, the, the higher the correlation, the lighter blue, the lower the correlation. We implemented a random regression model with three coefficients. Uh, and, and so in essence, these are the parameters that we're estimating as part of our model. Again, we can transform this back to the five time points. And so this is the, the full five by five matrix that we can reconstruct to approximate this matrix. And so you can see that uh, in this case, we can do a pretty good job of, of capturing the full information of all the time points in, a, in uh, this particular random regression function. And so if we look at what we actually see in the field in 2017, what we have here is we have just plots of the raw phenotypes over time. So we have growing degree days here on the x-axis. Uh, here we have the estimated genetic curves. Um, uh, these are color-coded, which I'll break in on these lower ones. If we remove the actual fixed effect part of this regression, this is what we end up with in terms of the estimates of our genetic effects. And so what we find is that uh, if, we, if we look at what the mean uh, curve for lines that are in the top 10% yielding and the mean curve for the lines that are in the bottom 10% yielding, we can see that we do see some pretty significant differences in the change um, in terms of NDVI values in this case over time. So we, we clearly are capturing something related to the end use trait um, in terms of how uh, the NDVI values are changing throughout time here. And so, uh, in terms of moving forward, we're going to explore other approaches to random regression models, examine new approaches to extracting phenotypes to form images. Right now, we're using a, a fairly uh, simplistic extraction method, and we're going to start looking at some new traits, such as biomass and alfalfa. And I'm going to, I think, based off of time, just skip through some of these implementation slides and just uh, go straight forward to the acknowledgments. I had one question for you on the, uh, I think it was the, maybe the NDVI, or some of the phenomic data, uh, the heritability really increased uh, with maturity. And so, uh, is what you're measuring there, like, is there essentially something like stay green that is uh, heavily influencing how long the plant is green for? Um, what do you think is, is underlying that uh, phenotype? So, so stay green, um, maturity might be the other thing that you're capturing there, which would be, you know, my initial guess would be that, you know, it's maturity in terms of some, some lines are starting to senesce earlier than others. Um, it was interesting that, that the NDVI didn't really have much predictive ability for uh, moisture or maturity, um, which would suggest that maybe it wasn't in this case, although we don't have a lot of data. But yeah, I mean, in, in general, what you see is that just the genetic variance in general increases with the later stages. And I, I think a lot of that is in the early reproductive stages, a lot of the plants look very similar to each other. And as you go later in the season, based off of maturity and other differences, you start to, you start to detect more differences. Yeah, yeah so I have a scientific question, more of a technical one. I'm just curious, you know, how did breeders sort of react to like some of the work that you guys are doing? I mean, it's, to me, as a scientist, I just, I'm lost. I get it. it's pretty complicated, hard for me to understand. You know, so I'm just curious how sort of like the downstream users of this technology. I mean, how do you how do you get the message across to them that these are important? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, you know, it, it's a it's a tough question. You know, so. I guess going back more to the genomic selection, because I think that's something that we're really trying to get implemented. Um, 
Breeders vary quite a bit in terms of what their background is and in terms of how much you know, background and statistics they have, um, you know, how strong they are in, in the area of quantitative genetics. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, the, the way that you have to communicate is that to be able to demonstrate that you are going to have a better performance in your program by doing things this way, and I think you sort of have to tailor that message depending on who you're talking to. I, I, that's probably not a real informative answer, but uh, you know, the degree to which I would show any type of a statistical equation would depend greatly on, on who I was talking to at the time. Um, but I, I, I think that part of it's just about them getting comfortable with it, and, and so that's why I think really the key is to just start getting them to start routinely genotyping their material and, and sort of letting them become comfortable with it and then sort of gradually moving them towards, because if you start talking about rapid cycle and making breeding decisions purely based off genomic information, you, you basically lose everyone right from the start because no one's prepared to do that. Yeah? Yeah, so I think um, I, I kind of skipped over some of this just because I didn't uh, do appropriate planning in terms of the number of slides I could get through. But um, yeah, so that so a lot of a lot of the approaches now, like so excellence in breeding, as an example, are trying to to approach this at a whole breeding program level, right? And so there's this idea of you know there are tools that you can use to uh, achieve a breeding objective. Um, and that breeding objective really needs to be aligned to, to really what we would call a, like a product profile, which is a clear understanding of exactly what it is you need to be delivering and who you're delivering it to and what environments you're delivering it in, right? So that's the first thing. Because you can be really effective at driving change, but if it's not the right change, then it's, it's a waste of everyone's time. And so, um, so there is a lot of focus on starting to, to really be uh, very thorough in determining exactly what it is you're breeding for, exactly who you're breeding for, exactly what it is they want, and, um, and, and understand those traits. And so participatory breeding is, is, is a part of that. Um, one of the challenges with that is, is uh, when, you're, when you're running trials um, under your control, you, you do have a lot of control over the quality and how it's being done. As soon as you start um, uh, sort of outsourcing that, there's, there's this danger that, that the data that you're getting back is, is not very good data. And so there is, a, there is a process of trying to understand who you can trust and who you can't trust. Could the quantity trade off with a potential greater quantity of data to work with millions of farmers and thousands of them trade off, you know, a useful way against the quality problem, do you think? It, it can, right? I mean, uh, it, 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 it's a function of how heritable the phenotype is versus how many additional phenotypes you're getting. Um, there's a cost of producing a lot of the seeds, so you typically do that a little bit later in the program as well. You know, with the early stages you'd be doing within your program, and then as you get further and further out. I mean, it's not, it's not that different than the way industry operates in the U.S. I mean, early stages, it's all on experiment stations, and then you start, later stages, you start running many strips in farmers' fields, and I mean, that's the way they, they need to. Well, let's thank Kelly once again.